A sound hadith related by Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, "If'alu al-khayra dahrakum. Do the good in your entire lifetime. وَتَعَرَّضُوا لِنَفَحَاتِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ But turn yourselves to the breezes of divine mercy. Right? That do the good your entire life. But turn yourself, make yourself ready and avail yourself of the breezes of divine mercy. Because there's times when there's special opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates. And one of these times is the month of Ramadan. But in our lifetimes, each of us knows that there's opportunities where we, there's some good that we could do, some act of care, of concern, of assistance, of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one could avail oneself of an opportunity of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we could take. So the Prophet sallallahu said, do the good your entire lifetime, but make the most of the breaths of divine mercy. For Allah has breaths of divine mercy, these winds of opportunity that reach whomever he wills of his servants. So turn yourself to those opportunities. And one of those opportunities is this month. And what is the opportunity in this month? The opportunity in this month is not simply the acts of good that we do. Right? The opportunity in this month is not the acts of good that we do, but what they are a means to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah about the month of fasting. And what is it a means of? Right? That, to, that you may attain taqwa. That you may attain thankfulness. But what people don't pay attention to that even taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an end in itself. Thankfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an end in itself. Typically when people quote the verses on fasting, they quote verses 183 to 185. But many of the, the scholars of tafsir and the, and the ulama of Islam have mentioned that the ultimate purpose of fasting is mentioned in the very next verse. After the verses of fasting, the very next verse is, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ if, And if you, my servants ask you regarding me, then I am indeed near. If my servants ask you regarding me, what is my reality? I am indeed near. إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am close. This is the purpose of fasting, right? The acts of worship that we engage in, the, those spiritual aims that we have of attaining taqwa of Allah, of attaining thankfulness for His blessings, these are all means to what? To closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what we should be striving for and which fasting opens a door of realization. For the one who reflects. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ujibu da'an. I answer the call of the one who calls upon me when they call. Li. So let them answer my call. Right? Because we call upon Allah. And this calling upon Allah, of course, is not just through dua. Your prayer, your fasting, your charity, and your life are all potentially calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sincere believer, their state at any moment is expressing a calling upon Allah. The righteous believer breathes with a sense of neediness for Allah. Their state calls to Allah. Their yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, I answer the call of those who call upon me when they call. But then Allah says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي So let them answer my call. 
وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي And let them believe in me. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they may be rightly guided. Rightly guided to what? To realize that closeness, that is reality. And very often we forget this, the, the higher aim of our religion. Right? That what is, you know, what are we seeking in life? And ultimately, it is this reality of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith related by Imam Bukhari, and it's a divine hadith, it's a hadith Qudsi. The Prophet ﷺ relates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever shows enmity to a friend of mine, to one of the awliya of Allah, I declare war upon. And then, who are the awliya of Allah? Right? Those beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My, and it be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, my servant draws close to me by nothing more beloved to me than what I've made obligatory upon them. And my servant continues to draw close to me through supererogatory works until I love them. But who is a friend of Allah? Someone who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the acts of good, both obligatory and supererogatory, are nawafil, the sunnas. Right? These are means, they're not ends in themselves. They're, but they're the necessary means to what? To attain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a reality that is repeated. Right? We recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of three categories of people. Right? There's those of the left hand who are the failures, who fail, who, have tur who turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then of those who are successful, there's Ashabul al yameen the people of the right. But then... What's the other category? There's the muqarrabun, right? The sabiqun, right? The foremost. Wasabiqun as-sabiqun, ulaika al-muqarrabun, the foremost, the foremost. Who are they? Ulaika al-muqarrabun. They're those who've been brought close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that we should reflect on because it's a reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of, right? In Surah Fatir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorizes His creation, right? actually the ser His servants from amongst creation, into three levels. In Surah Fatir, verse 28, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ Amongst them are those who have wronged themselves. وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ And amongst those are those who are... And مُقْتَصِدْ has several senses. Those who are moderate, right? who are doing a, a moderate amount. Right? Or it can also mean that they're between excellence and struggle. Right? Sometimes they do well, and sometimes they have serious struggle. وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And amongst them are those who outstrip others by permission of Allah. Right? Outstrip others in what? in drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in attaining closeness. So all these spiritual works that we're engaged in and all the great social dimensions of Ramadan that we're engaged in, we should strive to make these clearly a means of seeking the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't just have an iftar because you say, oh my goodness, I haven't invited my uncles for iftar. So you just invite them for iftar just because... Make all these actions means to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, there's people in Canada who are kind of worried because I just came from, from Toronto because there's a phenomenon that Muslims are congregating in large numbers at 12.30 at night at Tim Hortons, which is like our more refined version of Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. And there's like... Long lineups at 12.30, quarter to one, one o'clock. I know because I've been part of those lineups. Right, so you take your kids for some donuts or some ice cream at one o'clock at night. And you, know, you could just do it because you know, they're kind of upset that they had to be in Taraweeh. I was standing next to this one kid at our Taraweeh in, in Toronto. And after six rak'ahs, the imam got up again and said, Allah, but the kid looked up at his dad and he said, there's more? Right? So just, you just did it to placate your kids. Right? But all of these things, why would you do it? To seek closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to earn His pleasure 
through, through the good in all its manifestations. Right? But to be able to seek the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a few things that we need to remind ourselves of. The first of them is to be able to seek the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need, to, we need to gain beneficial knowledge. What is beneficial knowledge? Imam Ghazali defined it really beautifully. He said, it's ilmu ma yuqarribuka ila Allah. It is the knowledge that will enable you to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not just the, you know, what's called the BIM, the bare Islamic minimum. Right? That you just want to know, can I get out of the haram? Right? But there's much more than that. For example, just recently, uh, a, a few of us were going through the sunnahs of travel. Because right? we were covering the fiqh of travel in, in this class. So I paused and covered. Imam Nawawi in, in his encyclopedic work, al Majmur covers 62 sunnahs related to travel. And there's amazing sunnahs. Almost 10 of them, if you want to learn about what Islam has to say about the treatment of animals, and the environment, read the sunnahs of travel. Many of those don't apply directly to us, you know, because although they do at one level, because if you treat your car properly, it'll pollute less, right? And give you more mileage and it's advantageous. But eight to 10 of the sunnahs relate to how you treat your animal in travel, right? Which teaches you so much just about the, the broad ethos of our religion, right? That not only do you take care of the animal, but Imam, the expression of Imam Nau is, and you rai and you rai maslahat al hayawan that you take care of the best interests of the animal in terms of how long you ride the animal, how much you burden it with, when you stop. Right? And he mentions a whole number of considerations related not just to fulfilling the rights of the animal, but the best interests of the animal. Right? To learn how to draw closer to Allah, we need to gain knowledge, right? That, okay, I'm traveling, there's all kinds of opportunities. Right? And you appreciate, not just by the things you do, but you appreciate the beauty of the teachings of the Blessed Prophet ﷺ. One of the sunnahs of travel is that if you're going in a group and you're you know, either the person responsible for the group, right? Or you're able to assist the group, the sunnah is to walk behind the group. And it's not just out of humility, it's out of practicality. If you've ever been at an airport, one of the common things to see is these young people who are um, you know, carrying all the luggage and stuff, and they look back, and their elderly parents are, are lost like 20, 30 steps behind. Or the kid ran into the toy shop because the parents got, got ahead. The Prophet used to walk behind his companions. Why? To look, did someone need assistance? Could someone be helped, right? Is someone struggling so they should slow down a bit, right? So he was co command the, commanding the people he was going with from behind. And it also expresses humility. It's not just, okay, follow me, right? It's going together. There's many, many lessons to be learned from it, but this is a critical aspect. And very often we get complacent, right? Because Seeking beneficial knowledge is not just, okay, I know how to pray, I know this, I know that, my, my deen is in functional mode. But it is about bringing excellence, bringing the, the beauty of the prophetic way. It's taking advantage of all those opportunities that the Prophet ﷺ has shown us of seeking the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's something one should always connect to. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith related by Bukhari and Muslim, Whomever Allah wishes well for, man yurid illahu bihi khayran, yufaqihu fi deen. He grants deep understanding of religion. Deep understanding of religion is what? Is to have the ability and understanding to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever circumstances He's placed you in. Like how do you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at work? Right? There's all kinds of sunnahs related to work. Right? Most people... Who, you know, many, many people, when they become religious, they see work as a distraction from their spiritual life. But if you look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, your work is central to your spiritual life. It is a key daily spiritual work you engage in. The Prophet ﷺ said, طَلَبُ الْحَلَالِ فَرِيضَةٌ بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِضِ That seeking a lawful living is a duty after the prescribed duties. That it too is of the most beloved means of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how do you do that? 
you need to gain understanding of religion to be able to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a commitment that one should be nurturing in this month, that how do I take the means of drawing closer? Knowledge is not just about learning new things. It's also about reminding oneself. Right? You know, if you did a personal analysis and, and you looked at your prayer right, and asked yourself, are they sunnahs that I'm forgetfully omitting? You could any, and try this. Any one of us could easily identify five sunnahs that we don't do just because, oh, I forgot about that. Or, you know, just you stop caring about doing that. One of the benefits of knowledge is that it reminds you of what you already knew. Right? And that, otherwise, we just read the Quran once and I read it. Right? You keep repeating it because the lessons take time to be internalized. The second key of seeking closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you have to bring consistency in your spiritual works. Right? The Prophet ﷺ is described by his beloved wife, Sayyidah Aisha, وَكَانَ أَحَبَّ الدِّينِ إِلَيْهِ مَا دَاوَمَ عَلَيْهِ صَاحِبُهُ That the most beloved of religion, meaning the most beloved of religious practice to the Prophet ﷺ and therefore to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that which was done most consistently by someone. Right? Because that consistency is indicative of sincerity, of trueness. And that's one of the, the, the things that one should be thinking of as we slowly begin to enter the second half of this month. That of the spiritual works that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded me of in this month, what can I make part of my consistent routine? Right? What routine of fasting will I have after Ramadan? What routine of night worship will I have? Right? The Prophet sallallahu taught us about taraweeh, but the ulama mentioned the hadith about praying eight rak'ahs at night. The Prophet used to do that in Ramadan and after Ramadan. And one of the wisdoms why the ulama mentioned that hadith in the chapter on taraweeh is that if you do taraweeh in the month of Ramadan, there's something that comes after, right? which is this is meant to be a bridge to bring the sunnah of night worship into one's life. Look at the other spiritual works. How does one bring them in, in a consistent basis? Your Quran, etc. And to strive to bring excellence into them. Each of those things that you, you, that you do in your religious life have this commitment. How will I be able to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it? Right? And to be always working on that. The third, and this is arguably the most important means of seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you, you have to always remember that the way of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not relate only to your relationship with Allah, but it relates to how you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Right? The believers most perfect in faith are those best in character. They're not those who are best in worship and prayer and Quran. Is it those who are best in character. The closest door to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how you conduct yourself with His creation. And that's something that you have to be thinking about in this month. That how do I change my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Because that is the key to changing your relationship with Allah. You want to know what your standing with Allah is? Look at how you are in challenging encounters with other people. When someone annoys you, when someone upsets you, when someone says those harsh words, how do you respond? The believers most perfect in faith are those best in character, said the Prophet ﷺ. And where is this tested? It is tested in three relationships. And you want to see where you are in terms of closeness to Allah? Look at how you are with your parents. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure of one's parents. And Allah's, displeasure, and Allah's anger is in their anger. So ask yourself how you are in that relationship. How are you with your spouses? In the hadith on the perfection of faith being excellence of character, it's a sahih hadith related by Imam Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ continued, and the best of you are those best to their spouses. Right, so if you're coming every day to the masjid and praying sunnahs, but you're harsh and mean and rude to your husband or your wife, this means that you have the forms of Islam, but its realities are not yet in your heart, and you need to rectify. Because if you want to seek the closeness of Allah, you will not attain it without working on how you are with His creation. And the third critical relationship is how you are with children. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever is not respectful of our elders and merciful to our children is not of us. 
Right? And that's critical. How are you with your children? And it's not how you are generally. It's when they test you is when character is manifest. Right? When they annoy you, when they upset you. You got a new, you, you convinced yourself to get the new MacBook Pro with the retina display, and you're, you're looking at it, you're, and your kid came and he saw some cartoon or something, threw it out of the window, and it smashed. How are you then? That's the test of your character. Right? And so this is one of the keys. Like, how are you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation? Right? If you want to seek the closeness to, of Allah, remember the words of the Prophet sallallahu It is only the merciful who are granted mercy by the all-merciful. Be, be merciful to those on earth, and the Lord of the heavens will be merciful to you. So you ask yourself, if I'm seeking the closeness to Allah, how am I with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation? Right? And finally, in terms of seeking the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the most important sunnahs of the month of Ramadan that a lot of people neglect is to make a great amount of dua during the fast. Right? The Prophet sallallahu said there's three categories of people whose dua is not rejected. One of them is the fasting person until they break their fast. And this is a sunnah throughout the day to make dua. And particularly when breaking the fast. Imam Shafi'i said, as Imam Nawawi relates from him in Kitab al Athkar, that it is understood from the sunnah that one should make dua not only for oneself and one's family and the people one knows, but one should also be actively making dua for the general interests, the masalih of the believers and of humanity. Right? You should be making dua right, for rain. You should be making dua for, for food prices not to go, go up because of the drought, for relief for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. You should be making dua for the environment. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for the milk that, that was in the udders, right? And the crops that were in the fields. But that's part of concern for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, right? To make extensive dua, right? And what does dua express? Dua expresses that meaning of closeness, of recognizing your neediness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all creation's neediness for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take, uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And the best of what you could ask from Allah is what He asks of you. Right? The best of what you could ask Allah is what He asks of you. So these are three of the keys to seeking the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The, the first being seek beneficial knowledge. Right? Knowledge that enables you to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His closeness in your life. Secondly, have consistent spiritual routines of worship that you sustain throughout your life. Because that's a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And the third is, transform the way you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Have deep concern. What is religion? ad dinun nasiha Religion is sincere concern. Right? Religion is sincere concern. None of you believes until they wish for others as they wish for themselves. That's not wishful thinking. It is wish that is concern expressed in righteous conduct when tested in those relationships, particularly with your parents, your, with your spouse, with your children. And that concern is manifest in your dua. What you care about in your relationship with Allah is manifest in what you ask Allah in your dua. Right? What do you ask for in dua? Do you just parrot some words or just make demand lists to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you truly seeking His closeness and pleasure and love? Right? And what you ask for His creation, how much dua do you make for others? Right? That's a sign of how much you care about them. Right? And these are tremendous days of opportunities. We'll close with this hadith Qudsi, this divine hadith that the Prophet ﷺ relates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا تَقَرَّبَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَيَّ شِبْرًا تَقَرَّبْتُ مِنْهُ ذِرَاعًا That if my servant draws close to me by a hand span, I draw close to them by an arm's length. وَإِذَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبْتُ مِنْهُ بَاعًا And if they draw close to me by, by an arm's length, I draw close to them by two arm's lengths. وَإِذَا أَتَانِي يَمْشِي أَتَيْتُهُ هَرْوَلًا And if they come to me walking, I rush to them. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That door of mercy is always open. Right? We, we just have to direct ourselves to it and turn to it. 
right? And find a way of actually walking on the straight path, right? We are on the straight path if we have faith. But we always ask, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. Because we want to be of those who are taking consistent steps of seeking the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the opportunity that we have throughout our lives. Right? Do the good your, all, your entire lifetime, said the Prophet sallallahu But Allah has, in the days of your lifetime, divine breaths of mercy. So avail yourselves of them. Right? If my servants ask you regarding me, then I'm indeed near. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of this month. I'm indeed near. I answer the call of the one who calls upon me when they call. So let them answer my call. Let them truly believe in order that they be rightly guided. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those who answer the divine call, who seek his closeness, and who take the means of attaining his closeness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not let down the hopes of anyone who hopes in him. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا والحمد لله رب العالمين سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Since we are in this month of striving I just wanted to share just some of the, the guidance of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the early Muslims about rushing to make the most of the moments of one's life the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the sahih hadith that as-sihhat wal ni'matani maghbun fihima kathirun min an-nas that there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on ni'matan two blessings maghbun fihima kathirun min an-nas that most people miss out on Right? That they're cheated off. Right? Because and the, the, the term maghboon is from losing out in a transaction. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his life as being a transaction. Right? In Allah ashtara min al mu'minina and fusahum wa mu'alahum bi anna lahum al jannah. That Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their, their wealth in exchange for paradise. Right? So th this life is a transaction, right? And what you put into it, it's, it's an investment. What you put into it is the, the, you will have the return in the hereafter. But the Prophet Sallallahu says, there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on. What are they? Asihatu wal farag. Health and free time. And, and this hadith is a sahih hadith related by Imam Bukhari and others, and there's a number of similar trans um, uh, narrations. Right? Two great blessings that most people miss out on: health and free time. Right? And that health, they say, is at different levels. The, the Alma said, you know, the, the health that you lose out on one is the health of youth. Right? When you have strength, and once you reach adulthood, after a certain stage, you're only going to get weaker. And you're only going to get less able. But the other aspect of losing out on it is the fact that while you can, you know, while your heart is still beat, beating, while you're still breathing, you still have some semblance of health. And, and as long as you have it, make the most of what you have. Right? Make the most of what you have. Don't lose out on whatever you have because sometimes people say, "Well, you know, what can I do anymore? I, you know, I, I, I'm sick. I'm not." well this and that but you still have the basic health you know, as long as you're breathing you can be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can be doing the good that is facilitated but one of the other aspects of that as well is to see that that sihha, that health is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taking care of your health not just because you want to live for a long time but rather because this is the abode of opportunity. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who are the best of people? He said, Man tala umruhu wa hasuna amaluh. Whoever's life is long and whose actions are good. Right? So being a little careful about what you eat at suhoor right, is a religious consideration, not just because it's 
Not a good thing to eat too much, but because the preservation of your health is part of intelligence. Right? Because you're trying to maximize the good that you can attain in this life, because you want to maximize the returns in the hereafter. You want to attain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's closeness. As one of the ulama put it so beautifully, he said, your body is, you know, your, your body is a horse that you, you ride into infinity. Yeah, your body is a horse that you ride into infinity. So take care of it. Right? This is your, uh, don't lose out. Right? Don't, don't lose out. And if you were, you know, just to look at the kinds of things people do, right? Around Ramadan, you'd say, you know, we have some spectacular cases of, ultimately, it's foolishness, the way we can take care of our bodies, right? You eat so much, you're not able to get up for tahajjud. You, 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 you eat so much, you're not able. A lot of people say, you know, I had so much at so-and-so's iftar, I couldn't even make it to taraweeh. MashaAllah, that's great, right? So there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on. Health and the other is free time. But health, we should really look at one the moments Allah has given us right, of health, that when you find within yourself the ability to pray standing, to do all these things, make the most of it. Even if you're sick, you still have the basic health. And it's a religious responsibility. Why? It is, the fuqaha tell us, it is personally obligatory to take the means to have the health that enables one to fulfill one's religious obligations. Right? which includes, for example, taking care of your health such that you're able to pray standing. Someone who out of their own remissness, right, doesn't take care of their health, so they're not able to pray standing, they will be culpable for that. Right? Because they've fallen short of worshiping Allah as He has com commanded, right? Well, you know, there's things that are out of one's control, right? You have an accident, you have a bad back trouble, this and that, but someone who just overeats and doesn't take care of their health, etc., that could well be sinful. Similarly, to have the health by which you are able to fulfill your worldly responsibilities in terms of earning a lawful living, etc., this is a religious obligation. And taking care of one's health for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a door of drawing closer to Allah. The other tremendous blessing is time. Right? Two great blessings that most people lose out on, cheat themselves off, free time. And one of the biggest lies that people say is, I'm busy, right? It, and it's, it's a lie. Many of the early Muslims, there's certain things that they didn't like asking people, nor did they like responding to. One of them was, كيف hal? How are you? They said it's both the question and, and the answer are dishonest, right? Because if I were to ask Sheikh Abdullah, how are you? Right. You know, I, most, most of the time, no one wants to hear that, well, there's 10 problems right now, right? It's like, how are you? You don't really mean the question. And the person who has said, oh, I'm fine. They don't really mean the answer. Imagine you go to someone's iftar and say, uncle, how are you doing? And they say, beta, you don't know all the trouble. Like, What's wrong with this guy, right? So, some of Abu Talib al Mekki mentioned this in Qutul Qur. Many of the early Muslims didn't, didn't like asking that question and they didn't like answering it. And similarly, another question that they didn't like was, What's going on? Like, you know, how are things? Why? Because the again, the question is not honest and the typical answer would be you know, things like, Oh, I've been really busy. It's a lie. And most people, actually, they say people who do spend extra hours at work, right? It is very rare that people put in extra hours at work are actually working, right? And it's just part of how the human being works, that people like the stress. So if people have like a big deadline coming, most people aren't actually doing a lot of hard work, right? They're sort of putting things off and you know, drinking some coffee and stressing, doodling, you know, surfing other websites, doing other things. And say, oh my God, the deadline's coming. And it's rare that someone's genuinely putting in 60, 70 hours a week, right? There's always a lot of fluff time. It can be clear fluff, where they're just pretending to work and they're doing other things, or doing, they're doing other things on the side. And are you really busy? Usually, the, the answer is no, you're not. Okay? No, you're not. Okay? Or okay, 
even if you are working 10 hours a day at work, 12 hours a day, what's happening the rest of the time? Right? What's happening the rest of the time? A lot of times when people get religious, one of the questions they start asking is, how do I reduce the number of hours I sleep? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that excess is not in sleep. Excess is in waking. Right? That don't worry about whether you're sleeping six hours or, or eight hours. That's only a quarter or one third of the day. What's going on the rest of the day? What's going on the rest of the day? And that's something to ask oneself, that the hours of one's day, are we using them in a manner that optimizes one's standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They mention about the main teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa, Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, that لو قيل لحماد أنك تموت غدا لما استطاع أن يزيد من عمله that if Hamad was told that you're dying tomorrow, he would not be able to increase in his good works. Because right? he was already going full tilt. Right? And you see people like that, right, who are that careful of their time. Imam Ahmad used to make dua for one of the biggest criminals of Baghdad. Whenever he was mentioned, he would noticeably make dua for him. So he was asked like, why do you make dua for this man? He's a criminal. He said, because when I consider this man, and the vileness of what he's engaged in. But then I look at how much he is striving to fulfill his vile aims. I can't help but reflect on my own, my, on my own life and the nobility of what I'm striving to pursue. And he reminds me of how intensely I should be pursuing that noble matter. Right? These are signs like, you know, if you. I was, I had, for no good reasons, I had suhoor at a friend's house right da in downtown Toronto. After suhoor, we prayed Fajr. And we're walking outside, it's like 5.30 in the morning. Downtown, we're walking, and there's all these, you know, these fit fitness centers, you know, or there's one of my friends called them fitness centers. Right? They, they have the, you know, the glass windows, because they, you know, they want people to, to see it. And there's, like, most of, we walk by two or three of them. To, to, I don't know where we're going, actually, because we could have taken a cab right in front of his house. We were just you know, talking about changing the world. Um, and they're, they're half full at like 5.30 in the morning. Right? Why? Because you know, people are seeking dunya, and they're seeking it intensely. Right? But one should consider, like, in your time, what are you trying to maximize? Right? Are you losing out on, on time? Right? And that is one of the things, you know, one of the great spiritual works in the month of Ramadan is a work in which you're not actually doing anything outwardly. It is reflection. And one of the things to reflect on is your life. Right? And how are you spending your time? Right? And to do, a personal, you do some personal accounting, that my weekly schedule, what do I actually do? Right? And a lot of times, you, know, you ask people, do you, do you spend time with, with, your, with, with your children? I'm so busy, etc. But it's not real, right? Because we. You know, we have escapist tendencies, right? And now we have a lot of comfort zones. It's very easy to, you know, get into an internet argument with someone about something random. But I'm too busy for my son, right? You know, when's the last time you had a conversation with your daughter? Oh, things are so hectic and stuff. They're not, right? We waste a lot of time. Right? You're following the Olympics, right? And then you actually ask yourself, do you really care about, you know, like a lot of the Olympics aren't even sports, right? right? They've mentioned something, someone like, there's an 80-year-old equestrian, you know, like what, horse, horse riding. There's this Olympian who's like 80 years old competing, right? Or this, this one in, in, you know, shooting is, what do they call it? Yeah, right. No, no, shoot, like, you know, they're like, they, they shoot these guns. I don't, I'm sort of, you know, there's a lady who's eight months pregnant who's competing in the, in the Olympics. Like, why do you care about how someone can shoot, right? What's, like, what does it do for you, right? right? And you ask someone, what was, was there a big deal? No, a lot of it, okay, you can't, you're emotionally attached to soccer and whatever, it, ma it makes you happy. Okay, go, but do you need to watch that much of it? No, like a lot of things that we do. 
So really to, to take oneself to account that how are you spending your time? And it's not a question of just, just add extra worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? One of the greatest doors of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our social relations. How much time do you spend with your parents? How much time do you spend in excellent ways with family? How, how much time do you spend serving others? Right? Little things right? that, that, that have tremendous consequence. So, but I'm too busy for that. And it's not a question that you're too busy. That we're wasting too much of our time. Right? Because in reality, I was talking to a friend of mine who's you know, he's a senior HR manager for you know, a very large company. And we're talking about like hiring someone for something. He said, you know, there's, broadly, there's two theories of who, who you should hire, right? There's one thing is to look at who's available, but another way of hiring someone, right, is look at who's the busiest person and give them the job. I said, why? He said, because the person who's busiest already is making the most of their time. So they could probably, f they're already doing eight things, they could probably squeeze the ninth thing in. But the person who's not really doing anything, if you give them that one thing to do, they probably won't do that either, right? But, so, so this is something that requires serious reflection, right? And that's why there's an entire surah about time, right? Surah Al-Asr, right? And to look at how one is directing one's time. And one of the best things you can do in this month is to fix your, your direction in life. Right, so that you are, you can honestly say what that inna inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyya wa mati lillahi rabbil alamin. That my life, right, so my my prayer and my devotion, my life and my dying are all for the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Right. So th this is something that one should be thinking about in this month. Right. And all and this is one of the great wisdoms that there's both a spiritual dimension to this month and a deeply social dimension to this month, right? So that we can adjust, we can recalibrate our social relations, right? And they have a spirit, you know, the iftar is a, is a sunnah. You, we know that there's great reward in it, right? But so, so we can recalibrate those re relationships as well, right? So we can direct ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both by devotions and in our social life. So. Take some time out. And sometimes it helps to actually write these things down, right? Like, ask yourself, how do I spend my time? And how do I change my time, the way I spend my time? It's not just what you spend your time on, but the things that you do themselves, right? How do you use them? Right? The hours at work, right? the hours at work, right? That am I going to work with a high intent? Am I working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? What are the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ related to work? Right? Such as keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Have multiple high intentions in your work. Right? What are the opportunities of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at work? Right? People take breaks in the, in the mid-morning. You, 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 know, you know, even productivity-wise, it helps to take breaks. But you take that break, spiritually, go pray salat al-duha. Right? You, you look at what are other sunnahs related to work, and there's dozens of sunnahs related to work. You go to work with the intention of upholding good character, of being as, of assistance to others. Okay. It changes your attitude at work. You're not just sort of minding your own business, but you're, you're striving to be of assistance to others. Okay. So you go for your lunch break, you know someone else on your, on your work team, they're not taking a lunch break because they have a deadline because they're slacking off the last three days. So, you know, you're, you go grab them a coffee and, 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 a, and a sandwich maybe or, or something. Why? Because you're, you're not just working with what's called the GSB, the general state of blah. Right? You're working with spiritual purpose that I'm here at work to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? By the way, I conduct myself with work. By the way, I do the work itself. The work itself is meant to be spiritual, right? Because you're trying to excel in that work, not just because you want to get ahead in your career, but because Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Allah has decreed excellence in all matters. So that work has a spiritual purpose. You have the intention that people benefit from this work in the best of ways. As you're thinking about your career, as one should, right? You're thinking not just about how do I get to a place where I can make more money or have more prestige, but you're thinking about 
how do I earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my career? Because this time that Allah has gifted me with, I want to maximize the good in it. So you see, okay, what are c career choices that I, where I could be of greatest benefit to Allah's creation? Right. Which you may, maybe right now you're stuck in something that would be hard to argue is partic of particular benefit, but it pays the bills and says it's good, right? But you could have a plan to gradually go to something that is of genuine benefit. You know, you could, in some industries, frankly, some lines of work, like if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, there's some, you know, the kind of medicine that you're doing, you're involved with, is deeply problematic, but pays the bills. It's hard. So you say, how can I be transitioning gradually to something that is of genuine benefit to creation? That, and that changes one's thinking, right? So look carefully at, at, at your life. And it helps to write these things down. Just look at what you do in the course of the week so that you don't fall under the category of, of people that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this hadith, that there's two tremendous blessings that most people miss out on. Health and well-being. And we'll close with, with another hadith of the, the Prophet ﷺ, um, which you've, um, that the beloved messenger ﷺ told a person whom he was advising, اِخْتَنِمْ خَمْسًا قَبْلَ خَمْسٍ that take advantage of five things before five. Shababika qabla haramik, your youth before your old age, wasihataka qabla saqamik, and your good health before your ill health, waghinaka qabla faqrik, and your wealth before your poverty. Right? Your wealth before your poverty. Right? So when you have when when you have money, you should be thinking, how do I seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this? Right? وَفَرَاغَكَ قَبْلَ شُغْلِكَ And your free time before you're busy. Because sometimes things happen that busy you, that now you don't have that discretion. You know, you have a parent who, had, who slipped down the stairs and you, know, you have to be taking full-time care of them, for example. So now you don't have the discretion to go and study and learn and this and that. So you missed out to some extent. وَحَيَاتَكَ قَبْلَ مَوْتِكَ And your life before your death. And your life before, you de before your death. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who, who, who take advantage of these matters. Because as one of the early Muslims, Muawiyah um, bin Qurra said, أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ حِسَابًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الصَّحِيحُ الْفَارِغِ That of the people who are most thoroughly taken into account on the Day of Judgment is a person who, ha who had good health and free time. Right, who had good health and free time. What did he do? Right? And really, like, look carefully, because you know, so many people, and, you know, my, my father is in the category of the, you know, the wise old uncle, right? And they say some very insightful things. One day I was just driving with my father. He doesn't usually speak a lot. And some, you know, sometimes it gets kind of awkward, with your, with your, with your, especially with fathers, because you don't know what to say. And he's, he's driving and he says, for us, you know, the potato came before the couch. I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? And he said, it's, you know, the, the way society work is structured in our time, etc. People come come back home, and they're like drained. It's like they've become a potato, and all you can do with the potato is put it on the couch, right? So he says, so the potato came before the couch, right? and there's a lot of people. They say, I don't have time for anything, but you know, what time do you get back to work? What, from work, what time do you go to sleep? What do you do in those four hours, five hours, right? So really look at that. And one of the, the ways to, to, to get things done as well, they say that you know, to, to get things done, between every two things that you do, put in a third. Right? Between, so you're at home and now you get to work, but what do you do on your commute to work? That's a great opportunity, right? So, well, you know, I, radio, and sometimes some spending of money is worth it. Like, you know, instead of spending the time listening to the radio to figure out whether there's traffic on the route, get a GPS that, that has live traffic updates. You spend $50, but you don't have to listen to the radio anymore for that. And instead, listen to something of benefit or engage in the remembrance of Allah. So look at those opportunities. You have a lunch, a lunch break of an hour. Like, what do you do in that hour? 
you have a lot of discretionary time. I have a good friend of mine, really successful professional. He reads about two or three Jews of Quran daily during work. I asked him, how do you do that? He says, basically, you, know, you, work, he works, you know, he works in bursts and stuff, and as he's working, read a few lines of Quran, do some more work, a few lines of Quran, and through the whole day, at, you know, lunch break, before heading to lunch, that's you know, 10, 15 minutes, squeezes it throughout the day. And he's exceptionally successful at work, but he has that sense of urgency. I, I, I am seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way that is facilitated for different people is different. Right? The doors of, of good are, are many, but we should strive to, to really do a personal accounting, that what's going on in my life? And it can help write it down and make a commitment. And one of the things, they say you can be rewarded for doing less more than you're rewarded for doing a lot. How? If the less that you take on is something that you're going to, that you're committed to making cons consistent throughout your life. Right? But in, it's not a call, okay, don't only pray four rakahs of taraweeh instead. But to look at all these things that, are, that you are doing, how can you convert these after Ramadan into positive routines? How can you maximize the good through them? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant us insight and understanding and also that that he grant us beneficial knowledge and awareness of the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that we're able to uphold the sunnah in the things that we do so that we can seek allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever circumstances he places us in aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiruhu innahu ghafurur rahim wa barakallahu ta'ala fikum may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fasting and prayers بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله one of the reminders of the month of Ramadan is of our responsibility to remember Allah سبحانه وتعالى and this is a month of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most beautiful explanations of the reality and purpose and transformational nature of remembrance of Allah is one of the aphorisms, one of the hikam of Ibn Ata'illah. Ibn Ata'illah was a distinguished Egyptian scholar from the 7th Islamic century. And he was a distinguished faqih and theologian, you know, specialized in Islamic law and Islamic beliefs. But then he found his spiritual guide, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi. And after having, being a very distinguished scholar, he was teaching at Al-Azhar, he traveled the spiritual path as well. And he compiled these aphorisms. There's slightly over 200 um, spiritual wisdoms. And when he presented them to his sheikh, to Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi said, Ya Bunay, laqad lakhasta al-ihya wa zitta alayha. My son, you have summarized the ihya of Imam al-Ghazali and added to it. And it's an incredible work. Uh, and at a peak of eloquence too. It's very beautiful. And there's dozens and dozens of commentaries on it. Imam Ahmad Zarruq, who Sheikh, ha who, yeah, Sheikh Hamza quotes so often, he himself has 34 commentaries on this because this was something that he used to systematically teach. It was part of his spiritual teaching. He'd always be teaching on a weekly basis the hikam, and each time he'd write a different commentary on it. About a number of those are published. And this is about not leaving the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the consequence of that. But there's a beautiful story related to this. Because one of the distinguished imams of Islamic spirituality in the 20th century, um, who has a book written about him as well, is Sheikh Ahmed Al Alawi from Algeria, from Mustaghanim. Martin Links did a biography of his. In the early 1930s, he visited Damascus from North Africa, from Algeria. And Sheikh Abdurrahman al Shaghuri, who is the teacher of Sheikh Nuh Keller and, and one of the distinguished 
um, imams of Islamic spirituality and a great theologian as well. He was at that time in his late teens or early 20s when Sheikh Ahmad Al Alawi, this fam world famous scholar, came to Damascus. And everyone was talking about him because a big deal. Sheikh Ahmad Al Alawi is in Damascus. And, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman at that time was in his late teens, early 20s. He was quite excited too. He gathered his friends and let's go see him. And at that time, the, the, the French had, you know, because after this First World War, uh, the, the, you know, Syria was under the, the a French mandate. So there's quite strong anti-French sentiment. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, when he first saw Sheikh Ahmed Al Alawi, this great visiting scholar, the first thing he noticed about him was his socks. Because Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman used to work in the textile industry. Like he was a scholar, but he used to work in the textile industry. And in Damascus at that time, the socks that they had available were very, were, were thick socks. They're, you know, quite rudimentary. This sheikh was wearing very fine socks. Right? And, you know, he was in the textile industry, so he knew about good socks. And, and he's like, how could this be a sheikh? Right? Someone wearing socks like that would call himself a sheikh because the only way you could get socks like that in Damascus were French imports. But the only people who'd wear imported French socks would be people who were deeply influenced by the French. So he's looking at him. He, says, and he said he, he was young at that time and not, you know, not as mature as he perhaps should have been. It's like, like, what could he have to say about tasawwuf, about Islamic spirituality, with wearing socks like that? But he got curious, so he was following him. And you know, the sheikh took off the, his socks to make wudu. And he's standing there, and the whole time he's like, how could this man be a sheikh? What could he have to say about the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wearing socks like that, like you know, these really fine socks? Of course, North Africa had French influence, had actually trade with the French for hundreds of years. So these kinds of things were actually quite, quite common from, from before. So then the sheikh put on the socks and Sheikh Abdul Rahman was looking at him like... So he said he sort of sat at the back of the masjid like, who is this sheikh anyways? Like, you know, what does he have to say? But then the sheikh explained this hikmah that I'll be reading to you about not leaving the remembrance of Allah. And so Sheikh Abdul Rahman initially was like, you know, whatever, you know, just get on with it. But then when Sheikh Ahmed Al Alawi explained this hikmah, very soon, Sheikh Abdul Rahman was completely attentive. And at the end, he said, you know, I had to kick myself in the, in the heels and say, you know, if that's how you talk about spirituality, I don't care what kind of socks you wear. <laughs> right? Uh, because it was very profound. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رتبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man had come to the Prophet ﷺ asking for advice. Right? That, O Messenger of Allah, the teachings of Islam are very encompassing. So tell me something that I can hold fast to. Right? The, the teachings of Islam are very ex expansive. Because right? at one level, Islam is very simple. Right? But at, at, at an, in another way, Islam is very deep. Right? It has both aspects. Islam is an easy religion. It's not difficult. It's not... It's actually, it is very beneficial in one's life to have the five obligatory prayers. Every, every religious obligation has obvious, even worldly benefits if done properly. Right? The Prophet ﷺ says, Sumu tasihru, Fast and you'll become healthy. Right? If you make it a part of your regular routine and learn the lessons from it. Right? So at one level it's very easy, but it also has great depth. Right? It has great depth, which is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna hadha dina mateen, This religion is deep. So enter into it gently. Right? Gently, don't overwhelm yourself. Right? This, is, you know, this is the way of the one who's described in, in the Quran. Stand at night in worship, except for a little. You know, half the night, or a little more, or a little less. Right? But you can't do that tomorrow. Right? It requires 
this a high perfection. It requires a lot of striving. So this man came and said, O Messenger of Allah, the teachings of Islam are so encompassing, are so vast. Tell me something I can hold fast to. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. So Ibn Ata'illah, in this aphorism that we will read, explains why we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the benefit of remembering Allah constantly, even if you're distracted. Even if you're distracted. So Ibn Ata'illah says, لا تترك الذكر لعدم حضورك مع الله فيه do not leave the remembrance of Allah because of your heedlessness of Allah in your remembrance. I don't leave the remembrance of Allah despite your heedlessness of Allah during the remembrance. فَإِنَّ غَفْلَتَكَ عَنْ وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ أَشَدُّ مِنْ غَفْلَتِكَ فِي وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ Because your heedlessness of the remembrance of Allah is worse for you than your heedlessness during the remembrance of Allah. Right, so you're driving your car, you're going to work, you have 101 things in mind, right? Yeah, yeah there's meetings in the morning and you have to do, you know, there are these projects that you have to follow up on and you have, to, you have this and that. You have a whole schedule and you're thinking about all this stuff that's going to happen and actually more important than that, you know, Ramzan is over, you're saying, okay, where am I going for lunch, <laughs> right? That's like number one, right? And then you're, did, I, did I talk to the Minister of Interior about what we'll be having for dinner? And you're thinking about all these things. So you, you think to yourself, like why should, like, you know, and it's a sincere feeling, perhaps, that this is not an appropriate time to be making dhikr of Allah. My mind is busy. But Ibn Atala says, do not leave the remembrance of Allah despite your heedlessness of Allah during the remembrance. Because your heedlessness of the remembrance of Allah is worse for you than your heedlessness during the remembrance of Allah. Why? He says, فَعَسَاهُ أَن يَرْفَعَكَ مِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ غَفْلَ إِلَى ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ يَقَضَ Because it may well be that Allah will take you from remembrance in which there is heedlessness to remembrance in which there is wakefulness. وَمِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ يَقَضَ إِلَى ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ حُضُورٍ and then he may take you up from remembrance in which there's wakefulness to remembrance in which there's presence of heart with Allah. وَمِن ذِكْرٍ مَعَ وُجُودِ حُضُورٍ إِلَى ذِكْرٍ مَعَ غَيْبَةٍ عَمَّا سِوَى الْمَذْكُورِ And then he may take you from remembrance in which there's presence of heart to remembrance in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the wisdom. That, that change does not happen by merely wishing it. A change happens by making something consistent. And with that consistency, you bring excellence into it. Right? Because you know, if we all decide, okay, from, that, from this moment, I'm not going to be heedless of Allah. It's not like, okay, it'll happen. Right? You need to strive. And th the nature of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that in this necessarily begins with the tongue. And from the tongue, it goes towards the heart. So the heart becomes wakeful. You know, the, some of the meanings will come. But then from wakefulness, you have presence of heart. You're active. It's not just that you have moments of consciousness, but your, your, your heart is present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then if that dhikr continues, it goes from presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a state described by the Prophet sallallahu that al-ihsan and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That spiritual excellence is that you enter into a state of worship of Allah as though you behold Him. And if you behold Allah, you're absent from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it goes from, from dhikr in which there's heedfulness to dhikr in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. And then Ibn Ata'illah says, وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيز And that is not difficult for Allah. That is not difficult for Allah.
right? That the fruits of one's spiritual works, of one's remembrance, are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to take the means. And this is one of the means that one should strive to bring into one's life. To make, it's the prophetic counsel. لا يزال لسانك رتبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Even if your, your heart and mind aren't all there. Because eventually it'll become like second nature. Like the first, before when you start driving a car, you, know, that's, you have to be thinking. If you go back to when you first started driving a car, you know, the whole mind, especially if you learn how to drive stick, stick shift, right? You have to be thinking, okay, first gear, now put into second gear, now put into third gear. It, it requires thinking. Automatic is a bit, e is much easier, but still, like, you know, you have to be thinking, okay, you, do, you, know, you have to be, you know, let me look around now, let, check rear view mirror, check this. You're thinking about all these things. But then becomes second nature. You can have a conversation with someone while driving the car. You can be listening to, to a podcast or the radio or whatever, and you're driving the car, right? Similarly, with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other activities, right? And of course, this is not at every moment. You're, you're, you're having a meeting with someone, you might not be, it may not be appropriate to be engaged in remembrance of Allah while someone's telling you <laughs> about the business report, right? Or someone is making a presentation and you're obviously engaged in dhikr. But much of our, much of the moments of our life, even, you know, you are you're sitting with friends and family and you know uncles talking about you know episode 246 of Pakistani politics so what do you do instead of just sitting there passively you can still listen you're, just, you're quietly to yourself without making a, a show just engage in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is that becomes transformative right this is a, the prophetic counsel right so there's a, a, a few comments regarding this that um, Imam Ahmad Zarruq from one of his commentaries on, on the hikam that he mentions that when the author says don't leave the remembrance of Allah because of your lack of heedlessness of Allah in the remembrance he says that rather you know what we understand i.e. from Islamic teachings from the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is that one should be striving to remember of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever circumstances one is in. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding remembering Allah, كَذِكْرِكُمْ أَبَائِكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا That you should remember Allah as you remember your parents or more intensely than that. Meaning, the, the way you, you, you think about worldly matters. right? You're always thinking about something that you should be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah, like you remember worldly matters, but rather, even more so. I mean, if you think about how much time we spend thinking about worldly matters, how much time we spend thinking about Allah, we should be thinking about Allah at least as much, if not more. But the way you do it is you, you engage in the remembrance of Allah, regardless of what you're engaged in. Okay? And this is one of the... the the aspects of Islamic spirituality, that the Islamic spirituality is lived not in retreat from one's worldly concerns, but it's lived through one's worldly concerns, right? The believer, with their, they're at work and they're excelling at work, but their heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're with family and you, you strive to have the best of character, to be the most helpful and most concerned member of your family, but your heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They say it's a bit like the, you know, the, the, the court of the king, right? That you're, that there's, the king has a court, but then he has private chambers, right? And the one who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in their general life, they're in the court, but they're also with Allah SWT in their private moments, right? That, and it becomes a situation where one is conscious of Allah SWT, even if one's tongue is not busy with, with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And that was the state of the Prophet Wasallam. The Sahaba were, were once shocked because the Prophet Wasallam went to sleep and he was lying down and he got up and he went to pray. And the Sahaba had immaculate 
adab with the Prophet Sallallahu but they're also very straightforward. If they saw something that they didn't understand, with the utmost of adab and respect, they would ask. And that's one of the aspects of adab that are ignored and that we should instill, that we should be, have the highest of manners and respect for our scholars, for our elders, and instill that even in our children, right? that they should be able to, to question us, but with respect, that if they see us doing something strange, to ask, Dad, I, I just wanted to, to know, you know, um, and with full respect, that they should be able to object, right? but respectfully. So the Sahaba says, Ya Rasulullah, You've, you, you've told us that if you go to sleep lying down, you, 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 we, we should make wudu. But we, we saw you sleeping, and now you're praying. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am not like you. My eyes sleep, yet my heart is awake. Right? My, my eyes sleep. And the ruling of that is unique to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he was, his sleep was a state of complete wakefulness. Such that he was in a complete state of remembrance for Allah. And that's from what's considered, there's an aspect of the sunnah, that, you know, the sunnah can be haram to follow. Right? The, the sunnah, there's certain things that the Prophet ﷺ did that are haram to follow. They're called the khasais, the things that are unique to the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a wisdom to them, right, that we are commanded to emulate him, but there's certain things that are distinct about, about the Prophet ﷺ, right? And these are things that are not like dispensations for the Prophet ﷺ, but they all show his high rank right, and higher level of relationship with Allah SWT, right? Even while sleeping, his heart was still in slavehood to Allah Subhanahu Taala, in worship of Allah Subhanahu Taala, right? But it becomes a constant state because true remembrance is remembrance of the heart, right? And the, the, the tongue wakes up the heart. They say it's like a house, right? In which on the ground floor is this really lazy person right, who's asleep. Okay. And you know, your goal is to wake up that lazy person and get them to be doing something meaningful in life. So to wake the person up, you, you have to make some noise, right? So you're, you're on the... You know, your bedroom is on the first floor, right? That's like where the tongue is. The heart is asleep on the ground floor. So you got to make some, make some noise so that eventually the heart you know, wakes up and says, like, what's going on up there? And once it wakes up, it'll start hearing what it's saying. Then it'll get closer to, okay, what exactly are you talking about? And then it'll understand. And then the meaning of what was being said will go into the heart. But you have to wake up the heart. And the heart takes time to wake up. And one of the wisdoms of that struggle is that it expresses sincerity. Right? It expresses sincerity because if being conscious of Allah was so easy that you didn't have to strive for it, it wouldn't require any sincerity. Anyone could do it. Right? But it's just a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that something that is precious requires effort. Right? And part of the, that requirement of effort is, do you really want it? Right? Do you really want it? This is why they say, The sign of loving Allah is the love of His remembrance. And the sign of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is loving His remembrance. And, th and this is a divine command. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 42, Remember Allah with much remembrance. Dhikran kathira. Wasabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. Because he doesn't simply say, Uthkurullah kathiran. He says, Uthkurullah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah with much remembrance. And that's not sufficient. He says, Wasabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. And glorify him. By morning and by night. Sabbihuhu from tasbih. Right? But it, they, they say here it's not referring simply to saying subha you know, subhanallah, for example, but glorify him in your remembrance by morning and by night. Okay? And many, many other verses. Walladina amanu. 
Ashaddu hubban lillah, right? Those who believe what is there said there, more intense in their remembrance of Allah, in their love of Allah. Why? Because they remember Allah at all their times. Those who remember Allah standing and sitting and on their sides. Right? And the Prophet said, right? Should I not tell you of the best of your actions? It's a Sahih hadith. And the purest of your actions with your Lord. Right? And better for you than giving gold and silver in charity. And better for you than for you to meet your enemy and for you to fight them and for them to fight you. The Sahaba said, do tell us, O Messenger of Allah, you know, what is better for you than any other work, more beloved to Allah, better than, than charity, better than jihad. Do tell us, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Dhikrullahi Azza wa Jal, the remembrance of Allah, mighty and majestic. Ibn Hajar al Asqalani in Fath al Bari, his commentary on Sahih al Bukhari, explains because anything that is done with the remembrance of Allah is greater than that very same thing done without the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any action. And in reality, the very purpose of every other action is the remembrance of Allah. Why do we pray? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innani ana Allah, la ilaha illa ana. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God but me. Fa'budni. So therefore, worship me. Wa aqimis salata li dhikri. And establish the prayer for my remembrance. What is, what is meant to be the state of the believer in their work? in their business, in their leisure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the, you know, right after the ayat al-Nur, the verse of light, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ right? Those accomplished ones whom neither trade nor transaction busies away from the remembrance of Allah and establishing the prayer and giving zakat, etc., right? So the state, the desired state of the believer at work is what? That their work does not distract them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they work and they excel in their work, but they're working because the work itself is done for the sake of Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah, striving in everything they do at work to make it pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in that, they are engaged in the remembrance of Allah. And one of the aspects of the remembrance of Allah is the remembrance of Allah beautifies everything else. Why? Because if you're walking down the street, right? So Zubair is walking down the street and he's sort of just in a G GSB, general state of blah. He's just sort of thinking about Zubaida and how will he ever talk to Uncle Jamil that he wants to marry her. And he's scared stiff of Uncle Jamil, right? Because um, he used to give him a hard time doing taraweeh when he was a kid and he's been scared of him since. So he's just thinking about this and that, and you know, looking here and there, checking his, you know, his Twitter feed, um, and just distracted. Right? So how will he be in his walking? Right? He'll just be drifting down the street. Whereas what was the sunnah of the Prophet while walking? Right? It won't even be in his mind. But someone who walks, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be walking with purpose. And if you're remembering Allah with your tongue, it's only a, a step or two away from the critical question in life. How do I walk in a manner that's pleasing to Allah? So you're going to walk with purpose. You're going to walk. How did the Prophet ﷺ walk? Because that's... Right, so you walk with resolve. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, read about his walking. It's incredible. The Sahaba talked so much about how the Prophet ﷺ walked. He walked as if he was walking down... The, down a hill, right? He used to walk with purpose. He used to walk fast. The Sahaba said we, used to, we, used to, we were younger than him, but we used to struggle to keep up with him. Yet he used to walk with complete composure and grace. Right? They said it was like a, a ship that was cutting through the ocean, right? Majestic. Yet, you know, people who walk fast, 
right? If, if you have like, you know, if, if your boss is walking down the corridor and they're walking fast, would you stop them? No, you know, someone who's walking like purposefully, just, you know, they're going somewhere. So you just leave them alone. Yeah. Like after prayer, Brother Asif's like whoosh, headed out of the door. So he must be busy, he leaves them alone. But he, though he walked fast and with purpose and resolve, he walked with such calm and grace and concern for those around him that no one would hesitate to stop him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he combined between complete majesty and complete mercy, a complete concern. Right? So but if you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be reminded of these sunnas. Right? You walk, the Prophet someone who's walked, he'd always be smiling, he'd always be cheerful. If you pass by someone, he would be the first to initiate greetings. And this is not just a sunnah for Muslims. You're walking down the street, you pass by someone, we should be the first of people to be upholding those social graces, right? Of making eye contact, of smiling, of saying those little things, you know. Uh, sometimes this, the question, issue, sometimes just a, a nod would be appropriate. Other times you, you, you greet, you know, with, with, the etic, with the best of the etiquette that is suitable to one's context. Right? In other situations at work, you know someone, you know, you, you'd say those social niceties. But if you're in a state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your walking would be different. You're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your talking would be different. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your spending time with your parents would be different. And you having suhoor would be different because you wouldn't just sit there, you'd, you remember all the p p opportunities you have of seeking Allah's pleasure. I don't just sitting there waiting for everyone else to do whatever. You'd be the first person to serve other people, to try to give them water to help clear up, right? Because that's, you know, so th that's one of the aspects of the remembrance of Allah, that it beautifies all else. Which is why, and we'll you know, close with this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the prophetic example, He says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily you have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ For whoever seeks Allah and the last day, you have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples for whoever seeks Allah in the last day. But then it mentions something that people forget. وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And makes much remembrance of Allah. Why? Because you know, if you go to Sister Zubaydah, who Zubair wants to marry, and she, you know, she's sort of just drifting in her deen. You know, she used to have attend classes at the MCC when Sheikh Yahya was here, but then Sheikh Yahya left, and you know, she didn't take any of the new classes that MCC started after Ramadan. So she's just drifting, you know. So you ask her, do you, do you think you should be following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? No Muslim would say, no, you know, I don't think so. It's not in my 2012 plans. No one would say that. You see your family members who may be not as religious, you ask them, do you think you should be following the Prophet ﷺ? No one would say, no, I don't think so. But why doesn't it happen? Right? Everyone would accept that yes, we have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples. But there's two aspects that make us not follow the Prophet ﷺ. One is, Allah SWT says, you have in him the most beautiful of examples. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ For whoever seeks Allah in the last day. Right? So you need to have that sense of purpose that you're seeking Allah SWT in life. But the other one is, وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And makes much remembrance of Allah. What brings that sense of purpose into one's life, that I need to be seeking Allah. No one would say, no, uh, I don't think I should be seeking Allah and, and the next life. Dunya is enough for me. No Muslim would say that, right? But what is it that keeps them from actually making that a reality in their life? It's the lack of remembrance of Allah. You have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples, whoever seeks Allah in the last day, how is that sense of seeking Allah stirred up through the remembrance of Allah? Because that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're making Allah primary in your concern and consciousness. That's what remembrance of Allah is. And it is that remembrance then that then brings into mind the urgency of taking the Messenger وسلم, as your example. And not just as any example. To take him as the example in the most beautiful of ways, right? Because he, you're the most, he's the most beautiful of examples. He's not just an example. He's the most beautiful of examples. Whoever seeks Allah in the last day and makes much remembrance of Allah. That's why the remembrance of Allah is something that we should strive to make an integral part of our life.
How do we do that? First is, have routine, daily routines of remembrance. And the Prophet ﷺ told us how and when. He said, strive for complete uprightness in life, but know that you'll fall short. So what do you do? He gave us three keys. He said, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا Three words. Right? And this is, it, you know, this is from the Jawami' al-Kalim, the encompassing words of the Prophet فَسَدِّدُوا Remain steadfastly committed. Do the best you can. If you can't do something completely, you know you're falling short, don't say, well, that's how I am. No. Do the best you can. You know you're falling short. Yeah. You're not, you know, you, you heard that the Prophet ﷺ prayed eight rakahs of night worship, so you, first few days of Ramadan you did it, now you're struggling to do eight rakahs. Ah, can't do it. Can't do the whole thing? Do the best you can. You're not able to do eight, do four. Can't do four, do two. I can't do them like lengthy. Do them fast. Right? But, do remain steadfastly committed. Do the best you can. And be of glad tidings. Because it's a tremendous gift. You're trying to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing the best you can to do that. Right? It's a tremendous place to be. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالْغَدْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الدُّلْجَةِ And seek assistance in the early mornings and the late afternoons and a little of the depths of the night. Okay. Seek assistance in what? In striving for that complete uprightness, that complete Allah centricity. Right? But you know you'll fall short. So what do you do? Remain steadfastly committed. Do your best and be of glad tidings. How do you make that happen in your life? Seek assistance in three critical times. The early mornings, the ghadwati, which is the beginning of the day. And he left it general because someone could do it at Fajr time, someone could do it before they head off to work. And most people take an incredible amount of time, even if they think they're in a rush. Take a, you know, it doesn't take that long to have breakfast, you know, reading the, you know, you, you, know, you check your flipboard app on your, on, on your iPad, and you know, you've, even though you live on, on the West Coast, you're subscribed to the New York Times. Um, and, you know, just, you know, if you were to do some, what's called, you know, you know, net eternal analysis, NEA, right? Or ER, eternal return analysis, anything you read in the New York Times couldn't possibly be as beneficial to you as remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? As reciting a little bit of Quran, right? The fact that Romney dissed Obama in Oklahoma I th has nothing to do with the only thing that matters is really to, to be an inf informed that on, the, on election day when you put your vote who should you be voting for most of the news that you'll find out about is kind of useless anyway it's not that important to know that did Phelps finally win his 22nd medal or not big deal right? you could find that out but seek assistance in the early mornings have some routine of remembrance of Allah of Quran of dhikr at that time. What rohati And the roha is the, lit, refers to the time of rest, which is when people finish work and they get home. Or it also refers to the, the time of returning home. Right? That late afternoon, once you're done work, and this is usually, they say, around Asr time, but it, the Prophet left it general, because people's circumstances differ. On your return home, because you're done work now. And actually, even productivity-wise, people who stretch their work to all times of the day, it's not good for stress levels. It's actually not good for productivity. You'll get actually less done at work. Uh, you know, it's good to have a time where you're focused on work and time when you're doing other things. So you're done work, take a break. In, on your car ride back, unless it's something really urgent, which most things aren't, right? take a break. R remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Or do, do something else of, of benefit. Or once you get home. Right? But what do you do once you get home? You spend some time with the family, you know, you freshen up, etc. Then what, what are you doing? Engage in a little remembrance of Allah. Right? And, and by a little, five minutes. Right? We're not saying hours. You, if, uh, once you got home every day, you engage just in five minutes of remembrance of Allah. After spending time with the family, etc. By the end of the year, that would add up to 30 hours of worship that you've engaged in. وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّلْجَةِ And something of the depths of the night. 
And the expression in Arabic is so beautiful. وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّلْجَ Some, you know, something of the depths of the night, as if the depths of the night are this really rich treasure. Uh, you, you know, just or you know, dip into it just a little bit. So I was telling this to a relative of mine from my wife's side, one, so from one of my in-laws. Said, so, so it's it's like you, you mentioned a, a Hyderabadi sweet dish, right? So it's like that. Like it's really rich. And I don't like that sweet dish. So I said, well, something like that. Right? It's like this this something really rich that she in min. And a little of the depths of the night. Right? That even a little worship at that time will change your life. Right? And this is something you, if you can institute that in your life. And this is what Ramadan is teaching us. Right? That one of the great wisdoms, they say even if you're full, you should still get up for suhoor and have a little something. One of the wisdoms of that is that it's easier to convince yourself to have some suhoor. It's harder to convince yourself to get up and pray two rakahs. But we finish suhoor 10, 12 minutes before fajr time. Why? So that you can engage in a little remembrance of Allah at that time. Right? But try to make a commitment. You're able to do it for 30 days in this month, or 29. Try to carry that on the rest of your life. Get up 10 minutes before fajr. Engage in some worship. And you're able to get to work the rest of the year. You know, during this month, you can do it the rest of the year. Right? And this will be transformative. Right? If you can't do it all the time, do it on weekends. Right? And keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. In your daily business of life, it's not that difficult to walk to your car. Most of us can do it without too much struggle. Although I, str I have a good... <laughs> I have a tendency to stumble and trip and bump into things, but yeah, it's not that difficult to walk. So what are you doing while you're walking? Nothing much. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're driving, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're in the mall. It's not that difficult to get to the store you want to get to. You want to get to the Apple store and finally buy you know, the MacBook Pro with the retina display. You are, but what, what are you doing in the meantime? Nothing much really. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And it'll take you up in the levels of remembrance. From remembrance in which there's heedlessness to remembrance in which there's wakefulness. And remembrance in which there's wakefulness to remembrance in which there's presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To that remembrance in which there's absence from other than the one remembered. And that's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who become of those who are constant in their remembrance of Allah and whose remembrance is transformative. So it changes our, uh, us in our relationship with Allah and changes how we are in our relating to Allah's creation. So that brings beauty and virtue and excellence to our work. So we bring that excellence of the sunnah into our work. That brings the beauty and virtue and excellence of the prophetic way into our dealings with people, in our relating to family, in the way we spend our time so that our entire life can be a manifestation of beauty because Allah is beautiful. And he loves beauty. And it is the remembrance of Allah that brings beauty into one's life, that brings the light of prophetic guidance into our lives. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate our hearts with his remembrance and with consciousness of the way of his beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at tasliman kathira. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Any questions before we go? Go, go ahead. Okay, what's the So what's the best way of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's there's different ways of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And there's a wisdom in it, right? Because each type of remembrance has a different spiritual effect, right? Ibn Atayla said, Tanawat, um, Waridatul Am, Tanawatil, Tanawatil Amal, Litanawari, Waridatil Ahwal. That the spiritual works have been made variegated, have been made different by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because each has a different spiritual impact. The prayer benefits you in a way that's different from the fast, that's different from the way, the benefit of charity, that's different from Quran. There's different benefits. 
right? And it's part of a spiritual shepherding, right? You're like a herd of sheep, right? And you know, there's different things that are needed to, to corral all your impulses and inclinations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one aspect. The other aspect is we're created fickle. If we just had one thing to do, we'd become tired of it. It wouldn't be fresh. So there's different spiritual works for that. So it's not just do this and that's enough. Right? We have, so what's the, what's the best of works? That, what, the best of dhikr? The Qur'an. Right? But it's, it's not absolutely best in every circumstance. As soon as you finish prayer, what's the best of dhikr at that time? The, the specific sunnah dhikr is related to that time. Right? And you're standing in prayer, at that, at that point the best dhikr is the fatiha, because that's what you're called upon to do. Right? In other situations, the best dhikr is silence. Right? Because that's what you're called upon in a particular situation. Right? Um, and from, so, but in general terms, the Qur'an is the best of dhikr, but the Prophet also mentioned about the best of dhikr being La ilaha illallah, like a statement of faith. Right? Um, sending blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu has been mentioned, you know, mentioned as have, being of tremendous consequence. So what one should strive to do is to bring the, you know, the, the, the sunnahs of the Prophet Sallallahu related to remembrance into one's life after the obligatory prayers, right? To, you know, to hold fast to those routines and to say them with presence of heart, right? To say them with presence of heart. So that's, um, so in general, what's the best of dhikr? The best way of engaging in dhikr is to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu related to dhikr, to have regular routines of recitation of Qur'an, to make, take advantage of those three times, early mornings, late afternoons, and a little off the depths of the night, and to learn you know, the, the sunnah dhikr is related to these and to bring them in a regular way into one's life. What's the difference between tasbih and dhikr? Tasbih has a set, specific sense a tasbih is to, from saying subhanallah, from glorifying Allah, to affirm you know, that glorified are you, O Allah. But tasbih also spiritually refers to exalting, to the, just the act of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, which is not restricted to simply saying subhanallah. So sabbihuhu bukratan wasila, glorify him by morning and night, is either by engaging in tasbih in, in, by morning and night or by engaging in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the remembrance of Allah with an attentive heart is glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways to have presence of heart in one's dhikr, they say, and people make a mistake in this all the time, even with your Quran recitation. What people, most of us typically do is we say something and then we think about its meaning. And that's a complete mistake. Because what comes first, meanings or words? Right, when you sp Let's say you're having a conversation with, 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 bro with Brother Asif. So Brother Asif is, is setting up a new committee for some planning that they have in mind. So he's asking you some questions. So you don't just say something and think, what did I say? Right? The, you bring, the meaning comes first, and then you express it with your words. Right? But the same thing should apply to one's remembrance, right? To one's Quran. That don't say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and say, that means all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the world. And you know, which is, you bring to mind the meaning first and then you say it. They don't just start saying SubhanAllah, 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 and they say, oh yeah, this means glorify Allah. This, you know, so you're thinking about what does it mean, right? But rather, pause for a second, focus on the meaning, and then say what you're saying. And that's one of the wisdoms why, how did the Prophet Sallallahu recite the Qur'an? He used to recite the Qur'an verse by verse, and he'd elongate the last syllable, right? And then he pause, and then say the next verse. And one of the wisdoms of that pause is to teach us that bring to heart the meaning, and then say it with your tongue. And that applies to remembrance and also to Qur'an. So strive never to say anything until you've brought the meaning to, to your heart before you say it. Wallahu a'lam. Is there ablution in the requirement for doing dhikr? Uh, is, is wudu a requirement for doing dhikr? No. Right? Dhik, you can make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any state. Right? There's certain circumstances where it's obviously inappropriate to engage in dhikr of the tongue. When you're in the toilet, for example. Um, 
you know, etc. You're you're in a state of un, you know you're undressed. But even if you need to make ghusl, you can stay still engage in dhikr. There's a useful distinction. There's a difference between a toilet and a washroom. A toilet refers to you know the place you relieve yourself only. Right? So, so so if you have just a toilet on its own, it would be makru to make dhikr there, or while you're at the toilet. You're, you're sitting on the toilet, okay? That's when it would be makru to engage in the But a washroom, which is a multi-purpose facility, right? There's the toilet, there's a, you know, there's a sink, there's a bathtub, etc. That place, it's not makru to engage in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there. Of course, you wouldn't go and, you know, this brother Zubair decides, where do I make my daily dhikr? You sit in the washroom and make dhikr there. There's better places in the house to make dhikr in the washroom, but there's nothing makru in making dhikr in the washroom. So you're making wudu, you can recite all the sunnah, du'as, because the washroom is not a toilet. But you wouldn't make it either in a state of undress, or when you're at the toilet, or in the presence of filth. Right? So, you know, flush the toilet. Right? Or if you're some kind of interesting environmentalist, at least, you know, close the lid. Right? Because I have friends who don't flush every time, because they want to save water. <laughs> um, to each his own, right? It's not haram, right? Um, so you can engage in, in, in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there, right? Um, and that's actually, it, these, it's useful to know why, because often it happens, like I've dealt with many cases, for example, someone be, became Muslim, or even, I even know Muslims who started practicing and their parents were completely opposed to them praying five times a day, especially like Fajr, for example. Right, that they would like, actually cause a big problem. So what do you do? Like, a couple of months ago in Toronto, I was at this program, and this, Muslim woman, this woman had converted. You know, from, you know, she was a Coptic Christian before. And Arab Christians take their religion just as seriously as we take our religion. You don't, you know, you don't mess with religion. So her parents would kill her, or at least disown her. She was very pragmatic. She said, look, I'm, I'm finishing med school. My parents are paying for me. I don't, right now, I can't afford to be kicked out of my house and disowned. <laughs> right? I, I, and so she, she can't pray. And they wouldn't let her lock her door, yeah, her bedroom door. So what do I do? Sometimes she, she has to restart the prayer five, seven, eight times out of fear that they come in. So what do you do? just go, go pray in the washroom. Right? There's no other, she asked, I asked, are there other places you can pray in the house? No, So because they're, because they're a bit suspicious of, of her, because she changed how she was dressing, etc. She started dressing even in, in, you know, with them very much more modestly, etc. So they're suspicious. Just pray in the washroom. It's, it's not a toilet, right? It's not a toilet. Um, you have a, you know, you have a neocon as your CEO, and they're giving you a hard time. Can't find anywhere else. Go to the disabled washroom. Put something down. Pray there, Because right? that's not legally. A toilet. Like, don't do it in front of the toilet, whatever. But it's, of course, I'm not suggesting that that's your solution to where you pray at work. Right? If you can take any reasonable means to pray anywhere else, do so. But you know, you can, one can engage in the remembrance of Allah in a, in, in a, wash, in a, multi, you know, in a multi-purpose washroom. No, the, so if one does not, you know, if one struggles to understand the meanings, is, is the impact diminished? No, because the, these are spiritual medicines, right? The, the medicine has benefit even if you don't understand, right? But if you understand, it's like light upon light, right? But, but at the same time, what really benefits you? It's not just knowing the meaning, right? There's a sort of new religiosity that you see in our community if you just contrast that to some of the elders in the community, right? So yeah, some young people, they're really sophisticated. They've been to all kinds of intensives and seminars and this and that, and they know all these things. But just sit and watch, the, watch them pray. Watch them recite Quran. Right? And see some of the elders. Right? They may not understand all these meanings and stuff, but whose worship seems more meaningful? 
right? Because th what is the reality of worship? Right? Shah Waliullah Dahlawi in his Hujjatullah al Baligha, he says, the essence of all religion is ta'zim, is veneration. Right? It is deep awe and respect. That is the essence of religion. Right? So the one who prays, someone who recites the Quran, they don't understand, but they recite the Quran with deep respect, with deep awe, with a sense of magnification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't understand what they're saying. But they have that sense of awe in the heart. Will they benefit more or someone who recites it like an academic? Right? So you said, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So the L here is this kind of L. Hamd refers to this, you know? So it's a very, so they feel, they feel very sophisticated. But what, what is the reality of their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there? Generally disconnected, right? So it's not just about meanings, right? Right? The, the, the real essence of one's worship, and of course, there's not the discount meaning. Meaning is, you know, that's what maximizes the impact of, of one's worship and so on. But at the heart of ibadah, right, is, to, is for one's heart to be completely submissive to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be in complete awe and magnification, to have yearning and longing and love. And these are meanings that one should stir in one's heart. Like before you engage in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to stir these meanings of awe, of love, of yearning in one's heart, right? Before one's prayer, before, like in taraweeh, right? Most of us don't understand much of what's being said in taraweeh, but you could just stand there, okay, let's get on with this. Or you bring to mind the, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the wisdoms why they say, why is it that, you know, according to, you know, certainly the Hanafi school and in some of the other schools as well, in the loud prayers, the, the follower is silent behind the imam. And one of the things is to instill that sense of, even in the silent prayer. Why? Because you, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not simply by what you say, but also by learning how to stand reverently before your, before your Lord. Right? It, it, that, that meaning of reverence is stirred. So the remembrance still benefits. Right? I mean, it expresses that meaning even if it's weekly. Like someone's making zikr, but they're kind of heedless. But still, if you ask them, why are you remembering Allah? I say, well, just because. We asked, deep down, there's a sense of reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one should take the means to deepen one's understanding. To deepen one's understanding. And there's, there's books about that uh, you know, uh, and so on that one should always be working on to, to, to deepen one's understanding. And also, th the, the zikrs and du'as, they're... They, they teach us about the reality of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So they mention, they call to, you know, the, the Prophet ﷺ made encompassing du'as. That are really brief, but ask for the greatest of things. So you make it a you learn a du'a, Allahumma yas'aluka al-huda wa tuqa wa al-afafa wa al-ghina. The Prophet ﷺ asks for four things. Oh Allah, I ask you for guidance. Al-huda wa tuqa and tuqa taqwa, for, for mindfulness. Wa al-afaf and dignified restraint, والغنى, and freedom of need. So you learn the dua, even if you know the, the, the base, even if you didn't know the meaning, you're asking for Allah will give it to you. He's generous. But you know the meaning, you'll benefit a little. But anytime you learn a dua, make it think, what, what, what does this mean? Like these critical, these key religious concepts, what is guidance? You say guidance is, ask most people honestly, what is guidance? Could they give you a deep understanding of guidance? No. So that's something, that's one of the ways one seeks knowledge is to always ask the, the question, what and why? What does this mean? You know, and why is it important? Right? Why is the Prophet so I'm asking for guidance? So you put a circle around it. Right? You, the, the verses that you recite, you know, the, those key terms. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ What is the Nasr of Allah? Victory of Allah. Say, oh, victory of Allah means victory of Allah. No, but what does it signify? How does that relate to my life? So you ask those questions. And sometimes you'll find the answer through your reading. Sometimes you don't know where to read. So that's a good question to ask. Uh, you know that, where would I find it? This is an opportunity. So, you know, so Imam Zaid c comes and is giving a talk here. These kinds of things, you go and ask. You know. So I'll just think a question on top of your head. You ask. But also, you don't just ask just for the question. You also ask about where will I find these answers? Because you're, you're striving not just... You know, just to, just, just, just to be a mere follower, but to, but to gain understanding of the deen, whomever, you know, so that you can walk with insight on the spiritual, on the, 
on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So, so that's a good thing to do, to always be, be thinking, okay, what does this mean? You read, read some verses and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two of his names. So you ask her, you know, and you just make a note of it. It's good when you're reciting Quran to keep pen and paper next to you, right? And don't keep stopping, don't keep interrupting your recitation, but just make a little point. What, what does this mean? So you have a list of questions, right? And you, you seek answers to them, right? Because sometimes it's intriguing, like, what does it mean that Allah is a shakur? Shakur means the thankful, the grateful. Like, how is Allah grateful? Like, like, what does that mean? Right? So you ask. and say, okay, I need to find that out, right? And so, but yeah, but to, to deepen one's understanding of those terms is very powerful. Like the, 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 the what are called the baqiyatu salihat, the lasting good deeds, to say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Right? One of the great scholars of Islam, Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam, explains how all Islamic belief returns to these four statements. Actually, all of it can be taken back to la ilaha illallah. All that we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be understood by the expression, indication, and implication of our saying la ilaha illallah. Right? And if someone understands that, they're saying la ilaha illallah, conscious of those meanings, but with the consciousness that is not an academic consciousness, right? But it's a reverent consciousness, right? Because it's very dangerous because a lot of people, they start learning and they feel that their relationship to Allah has weakened. Because from going into a state of neediness to Allah, you go to a state of sophistication. I, you know, I know what's going on. <laughs> and that's not a good place to be, right? Um, as well. Wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa uh, alaykum question. One is, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard uh, from a lot of shayof uh, to they sing, uh, uh, wake up in the middle of the night and cry, mm. you know? It's, it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to cry. You know, it's like Sheikh Yahya said, push yourself to cry. <laughs> I try. But sometimes, yes, I can cry, but sometimes not yet. And the second uh, question is, um, I fell asleep one night, I, take my I, I didn't take my medication, so I had uh, um, last week, so the one day uh, uh, fasting, I, I didn't fast because of the medication. So, yeah. so the first thing that, you know, that so many scholars incur, I mean, the Prophet said, cry when you recite the Quran. And if you can't cry, make yourself cry. But sometimes you try to make yourself cry and you can't cry. You're not responsible for crying itself, right? You're responsible for striving. And that's in general, right? The, the ulama asked this intriguing question right in the beginning of when, in Surah Baqarah. The Quran, Allah SWT describes the Quran as being Hudal lil muttaqeen, a guidance for the muttaqeen. So they say that it, is this not a problem? Because the muttaqeen have things sorted out in life. And so if, if it's guidance for them, then what about, the, what about the poor people who are not muttaqeen? If it's not guidance for them, then they're, they're, they're struggling and this is not, won't help them. But they say that the muttaqeen are at two levels. There's someone who's realized in what taqwa is. Right? Taqwa entails a certain state of you know, state and state of affairs in your life, right? So some people are, are realized in that virtue, and they're muttaqin. But there's another category of people who are considered of the muttaqin. Who are they? They're the people who have four qualities. They're they're seeking that virtue, like taqwa, for example, right? So they're seeking it. Number two, they're striving for it. So they're taking the means. Number three, if they ever fall short of that virtue, they repent. And fourth, they return to what that virtue entails. So it's S-S-R-R. -R, seeking, striving, repenting, returning. Anyone who has those four, four qualities is considered to have that virtue. So let's say you're, you know, you're hot-blooded. You get angry really quickly. 
you could still be considered with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of the forbearant, of those who have hilm, of those who control their anger, even though you lose control once in a while. How? You have those four qualities. You're striving to be forbearant, to have hilm. Yeah, you're, you're, you're seeking it. You're striving to, you, you, to take the means to it. So you find out, how do I control my anger? How do I stay calm? What are the sunnahs related to it? And you're trying to, you're, you're taking the means. Right? So you're seeking it, you're striving. So the third is, anytime you fall short, you repent. And fourth, you hasten to return. Follow a bad deed with a good deed and it will wipe it out. Right? So you got upset at your, your, your dad. So, you, so you, you repent and you try to redress it. Right? You apologize, etc. You, you know, you, that little gesture you know, that will endear him. So your mom's upstairs, your dad's diabetic, but your, mother, your mom denied him rasmalai. But you took some rasmalai anyway. Said, so dad, here you go. I'll cover for you. Right? So when mom comes down, you take the bowl and pretend you're eating. Right? So you take the means of rectifying. And this applies to any virtue right? that one's struggling with. You're considered to have that virtue if you do those four things. Same thing with, 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 you know, with crying, for example. You try to stir your heart. You think about Allah's favors you, you, you know, and so on. But you're not responsible for results. You're responsible for taking the means. And they say, you know, fake it till you make it. Right? Initially, you have to kind of force yourself. And eventually... It'll be second nature. One last question. The question which I had was, uh, what suggestion or recommendation would you have for raising kids or, or introducing Islam to kids in, in the present world without making it overbearing on them? Okay. Um, exactly. Actually, we have a, uh, on Seeker's Guidance, we have a course on Islamic parenting, so you may want to check that out. The, the, all the courses are completely free, so it's like you know. Um, so if you just go seekersguidance.org, there's. You may want to hurry though, because that's one course that gets filled before any others. Is that and the Islamic marriage course, they they, they get full, uh, like right away. Um, but that that's because we we. Co we, we cover a classical text on Islamic parenting. I was amazed by the text. There's incredible insight. I, I'm a I have, I have three kids. It was incredible. I, you know, there's some some amazing things in it. But in short, aim high. It's simple as that. Like you know, we have all these worldly ambitions. We want to get them to the best of universities and to have the best of careers and you know this and that. But in terms of Dean, we have sort of a, a you know, a defensive remorse. We say, I I want my kids just to be good Muslims, and that's a bid'ah. To want oneself just to be a good Muslim or wants kids to be good Muslims, is a bid'ah. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ never asked, Oh Allah, make us good Muslims. All the du'a is asking for, is asking for excellence. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, Inna Allah yuhibbu ma'al umur. Allah loves high matters, and dislikes paltry ones. And he said, so if you ask Allah, ask for the highest of paradise. Ask for Jannah al-Firdaus. Don't just say, Oh Allah, once all the sinners come out of hell after being punished for a long time, and have been roasted and toasted, you know, drag me out by my, my burnt toenail and find me a corner of paradise where I can fit in. Because right? you're asking not according to how you are, you're a asking according to Allah's generosity. Right? And you know, what's the sunnah dua in the Quran? What's the dua for our, for our family and our children? رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ آيٌ O oh, oh Lord, grant us in our spouses and in our offspring a joy for our eyes. وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, And make us the foremost of the foremost. Right? Make us the foremost of the people of taqwa. Not just make us among the people of taqwa. Uh, who is an imam? An imam is an exemplar. Right? An imam is someone who is worthy of emulating because of what they encompass of virtuous qualities. Right? That's an imam. Right? An imam is an exemplar. Someone worthy of following. So make us imams of the people. So that's how you aim. You want your children not just to be good Muslims. I want my kids to be praying five times a day. That's, that's sad. If you look at it at a community level, all we want to do is, and you hear this rhetoric in our community, we want to preserve Islam for our kids. You know? You say, Imam Zaid puts this over you. He said, you know, said, you know if you, he said, aim for the moon. Uh, uh, so aim for, you know, so, sorry, he says, aim for the stars. Because if, you, you know, if you fall short, you might just land on the moon.
right? But you, if you aim just to pass, good. And if you fall a little short, you'll fail, right? So this sort of sort of siege mentality, no, right? You you know we should be aiming really high, and the dua is incredible, right? At some time, you should have someone do tafsir of this dua. It's incredible. There's so many meanings. Firstly, you don't ask it for yourself. It says, "Rabbana hab lana, grant us," because you cannot raise righteous children on your own. You need family. You need community, right? And then it says, "Min azwajina," in in our spouses, because you you wa He doesn't teach. Allah Subhanahu wa does not teach us to say in our children. It says. The children is awlad. Zurriyatina. What's the difference between zurriya and awlad? Zurriya is your offspring, are all those who are descended from you till no specified end. Children would refer to your, your own children and maybe by extension your grandchildren. But zurriya, your offspring, are all those who are descended from you. Because you think long term, right? Because you, you are rewarded not just for, for the good of your children, but you know, what you establish for the long term, right? And that's how the believer thinks. You don't just think, okay, our masjid, how can we just make, you know, get, you know, you know I'm president till 2012, end of 2012, so let's just keep things running. But you're, you know, you, the believer looks into the horizon of in eternity, looks long term, right? And we're trying to not just get by, but to have excellence, right? And that applies to children too, right? That, to aim high. Ask from the Most High and take the highest of means, right? And and their facility. It's not difficult, right? It's not it's not difficult. But we just you know, if one if one has the right intention, and takes the right means in the right way, one should be ex hopeful of right results. But if one's intention isn't right, one doesn't take the right means, right? It's wishful thinking to expect right right results. Like I was sitting, you know, at actually my parents' house, and you know, there's. A, a, a relative is asking, you know, I'm kind of worried. My daughter's 11 now, and she's not showing a lot of interest in, in wearing hijab. And he's, he's a religious guy. And there she's sitting playing on some console, and she's playing some tennis game with you know, female characters, all wearing like, you know, like this little piece of cloth <laughs> wrapped around their mid-area. So you couldn't even call it a skirt, I don't think. Like, you know, there's this like, obvious dissonance. Right, right. So you know, but if one does take the right means, one can be expend. You know, f f you know, um, one sh should be hopeful of the right results because that's the sunnah of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in creation. And even if one doesn't, one's not responsible for results. If you in had the right intention, you took the right means, you're considered to have fulfilled your duty with excellence. And it's as if you raise righteous children, even if they come out different. Because at the end of the day, you know, Allah is the the turner of hearts. There's Prophets whose children strayed from the straight path, right? Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, he said, he's not of your family, right? right? When, when he made dua for his son who refused to come on the boat, right? Um, but that's the exception rather, rather than the rule, right? Um, so, so the, and there's incredible, and you know, the, there's, we let ourselves, you know, the number of Muslim parents who read all these books on parenting, Right? And you ask them, so what have you read about the sunnahs of the Prophet with respect to parenting? Nothing. Right? And the ultimate self-help guide is the sunnah of the Prophet right? You won't find anything that comes anywhere close to it. Because right? Right? You know, this is the one who said he, he was giving encompassing speech. Right? There's no one who encompassed wisdom like the Prophet in anything. Alayhi salatu You had mentioned Um, yeah, seekers' guidance. It's an it's an Islamic um, learning initiative. So we have online courses, both for, for general religious learning and also for for people who are st students of knowledge and want to learn their religion yeah. systematically at a, at a high level. Um, and we have an answer, a question and answer service, and 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 podcasts and, and other uh, services as well. But the, the core offering is our our, our, our courses, and we, we follow this initiative called Knowledge Without Barriers, so all our services, including all the courses, are completely free, right? Um, there, there's, there's no charge for them. Um, so, registration actually opened last week for the, 
for the second quarter um, or third quarter. I'm really bad with numbers. Um, so do check them out. You asked about parenting. There's there's a course on Islamic parenting, and there's courses in Islamic beliefs and and and, and worship and spirituality. Sheikh Yahya has a number of courses um, there, which you know he he, he taught here um, over the last year. Um, he has a number of courses. Imam Afroz Ali from Australia, who's an incredible scholar, mashallah. Uh, he has a number of, of excellent courses, um, and there's a number of other uh, teachers who have courses. and And these courses are are downloadable. You you know, you know the the actual lessons you can download, and there's an online forum to ask questions. And once a month, there's a um, a live session where you can, you know, interact with the teacher and ask questions in person, etc. And um, as well. Um, and we also have some live classes. They're paused during Ramadan. We have some live classes th throughout the year, some, you know, which gives the opportunity for, for, you know, for, 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 you know, for live interaction. Uh, so there's a, a number of, of live classes as well with, with, with some leading scholars. Um, so you, you may want to check that. So Seeker's Guide, it's not secret guidance. Once I, someone, I was in Michigan, and so, so someone asked, like, you know, could you say something about Seeker's Guide? Said, but this, this older uncle came and said, Bita? I have one concern about what you're saying. I said, yes, uncle. He says, you know, why did you call your project secret guidance? Islamic <laughs> teaching should be public. <laughs> I said, no, it's not secret guidance. It's seeker's guidance. Right. Seeker's guidance. S-E-E-K-E-R. Yeah, seeker's guidance, all one word, dot O-R-G. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.